Okay, I guess we should get started. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's a great pleasure today. We're having Serena Petoni here. She did her PhD in, at MPA uh, some years ago and then moved to Sussex for two years for a postdoc and now, now is enjoying the great weather in Santa Cruz and we will be hearing about yeah, the mountain and the meaning of the mission. Good to see you. Like this? Yeah. Okay. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Thank you very much for coming to my seminar. Um, it's a great pleasure to talk about you, to talk to you about my research, and thanks for inviting me. All right. So Jan said everything already. I'm in Santa Cruz, and um, today I'm going to talk about the work that I haven't done with people in Santa Cruz actually, but with the Obshe and the Aus team in Leiden. And in particular, I will be talking about mapping the integrality medium through metal line emission at low and high range. Okay, so the work I'm going to bring, this is just a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about in the next 45 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to talk about some basic properties of the intergalactic medium that will be useful for the rest of my talk. And in particular, I will discuss a few techniques that we can use to detect the intergalactic medium, in particular absorption and emission lines. Then I will describe briefly the simulations I've been using for this work. These are the OWL simulations which have been running in Leiden and which I will spend some time to describe in some detail. And then I will finally go through some of our results. I'm not going to give you all the details of our results. I'm not going to give especially to go through all the um, numerical tests we have done on the simulations, but I will just focus on some of our main results. And if you want to know anything more, you can always come to talk, talk to me later. Um, so, okay, the intergalactic medium. Um, the intergalactic medium composes most of the baryonic uh, matter in the universe. So we know that the universe is composed mostly of dark energy and dark matter, and I'm not going to talk about them today, but if we look at the baryonic component, about 90%, if not more, of the, of the baryonic matter is actually in diffuse hydrogen, helium, and a little bit in diffuse metals in the universe. So, this means that most of the mass is not in galaxies or in stars, which we can detect through direct, direct um, starlight, for example, but it's in a form which we need different techniques to detect. So this is 90% of the mass, and so that's a, that's a sensible fraction of the total, and we need to know what happens to this mass. And there are several reasons why we need to care. First of all, because if we can measure the distribution of this mass, we can have information about the power spectrum of density fluctuations in the universe, and also uh, about the evolution of the density fluctuations, for example, from redshift 6 down to redshift 0. Also, being this most of the mass in the universe, this is actually the main reservoir of gas from which the stars and galaxies form. So you know in the state of this gas before it collapses into galaxies and stars, it gives us information about the process of galaxy formation. Also, if we study the metallicity of the inter intergalactic medium, we can put strong constraints on the cosmic star formation history in the universe. And the metals and the distribution of metals, the temperature of metals and so on, give us information about the interplay between the galaxies and, and the intergalactic medium itself, in particular to do feedback processes. And, and here for feedback processing, I'm, processes, I mean especially supernova feedback, although also AGN feedback can be constrained. No, this way. All right, so most of what, what I will show you in the following are results obtained through numerical simulation. Numerical simulations are a very powerful tool to study the intergalactic medium, and so far are actually a more powerful tool than observations because they give us much more information about temperature, density distribution, metallicity distribution, and so on, although we definitely would like to have as much information from the real observations as, as from simulations. So what you see here is just a, um, one of these Simulation. This, in particular, is from Volker Springer from 2003, from a uh, simulation realized with Gadget 2. And you can see the evolution of the density distribution of the gas down from redshift up from redshift 6 to redshift 2 down to redshift 0. So you see how the gas at high redshift is very diffuse, and then with the passing of time, it collapses into structures, into halos, it forms filaments, it forms knots, and these are clusters and groups. And it forms also larger voids where you can see that the density of the gas is very low. Uh, this box is about 100 megaparsecs, and this is basically the largest group. So as much as you can study the de density distribution of the gas in simulation, you can study the temperature distribution. And this, for example, are three different snapshots from a simulation from Channel Striker at redshift zero as a function of the, the temperature of the gas. 
This is at redshift zero, as I said. So the temperature distribution of the intergalactic medium ev evolves with redshift. As you can see here at redshift zero, the very low density gas, um, the very low temperature gas with temperatures lower than 10 to the 5 is very diffuse, uh, relatively low density. This gas is the gas that is traced by the lemon alpha forest, is mostly photoionized, and um, is relatively, its distribution is relatively uh, homogeneous. I'm saying relatively because, it's, you, as you can see, it's not homogeneous. If you go to higher temperatures, then you see, for example, in the temperature range between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 7 Kelvin, what is called as the warm hot intergalactic medium. Um, this gas, as you, if you compare it with the other gas, is more clustered, it's more uh, condensed into filaments, into groups. As you can see, it also traces very large density structures. And it's definitely overdense in with respect to the Lyman alpha forest gas. This gas is hotter, it's not photoionized anymore, it's mostly collisionally ionized, and the temperature of this gas is actually determined by the structure formation process and the gravitational shocks that are created when gas collapses onto onto dense structures. Of course, if you go to higher temperature gas, in particular higher than 10 to the 7, you find the intercluster medium or the hot intergroup medium. This is the most dense, is the hottest, is the densest, is the most metal enriched gas, and as you can see, is is um, condensed into mostly into the halos of groups and clusters. In this slide, I want to show you the distribution of the gas on the density temperature plane. This is from the our simulations. Um, the gas here is at redshift 0 0.25, and this, these two distributions represent the metal, uh, the mass weighted density, the density temperature distribution of the gas. And this distribution on this right panel here is instead the metal mass weighted distribution. So here the density is in uh, neutral hydrogen number density in, in atoms per cubic centimeter. This you can you can imagine this is the, the density, a proxy for density in general. So if you compare these two main distributions, and this is the main point I want you to bring home, is that you can see that the bulk of the metals, which are here, and here, but let's talk about this later, is not tracing the bulk of the mass. The bulk of the mass is also here, but most of the mass is actually in this regime. So the density temperature planes tells you um, at what density and temperature the gas is, of course. And if you look at this, this is the bulk of the mass, and in this temperature and density range, you basically find the Lyman alpha forest gas. At high, at similar temperatures, but at higher density, that is here, you find gas which is collapsing onto halos. So this is halo gas mostly, which is cooling and then forming the, the interstellar medium of galaxies. In these very high densities, you find gas which is star forming and is in the equation of state. Um, so basically, this is a really star forming gas in the simulation. If you go to higher temperature, and in particular in this regime, you find the warm hot intergalactic medium. Um, and if you go at even higher temperature, you find the intragroup intra medium, which is the, the, the hot gas. If you look at the distribution of the metals, metal mass in this case, you find that a lot, most of the metals are in the star forming gas or in stars. Uh, a sizable fraction of the metals are in this, in this regime, so in the halos of galaxies, but most of the metals um, and these are the diffuse metals, are in the warm hot intergalactic medium at this redshift. And I wanted to take, uh, take notice of this plot because I will show you these plots again in the following, but not metal mass and mass weighted by emission, by emission weighted. All right. So that was, those were snapshots at redshift zero. You can also try to trace the evolution of this gas as a function of redshift. So, for example, in this plot, what is shown here is the fraction of mass which is in different components of gas as a function of redshift. This is a, a figure I got from a paper from Romil Davey and collaborators. It, it's one of the, of the several models actually studied. The numbers you can see here are not the absolute numbers. They are only, for, they are only valid for this model. Different simulations will give you numbers which are different by a few percent, up to 10, 20 percent, but the main trend of these lines will be constant for every model. So if you look at this, this plot, you see that as at high redshift, most of the baryons, most of the mass, is in the Lyman alpha forest, in the gas that traces the Lyman alpha forest. And there's this, this dashed line here. 
as you can see, the, the, the fraction decreases with redshift, and at redshift zero, less than half the baryons are traced by the Lyman alpha forest, while at redshift three, most of them are traced by the Lyman alpha forest. If you look at this dash, dot dashed line, this is the hot intercluster gas, and it's this one. So you can see the only a few, a few percent of the gas in the, is in the intercluster medium at every redshift. On the other hand, the gas which is condensed, that is star forming, which is this dotted line here, is this one. And this also increases with redshift, so it goes from a few percent or less up to about 30% at low redshift. This is gas that is in stars, so this is stars, plus gas which is in halos of galaxies. So still diffuse but condensed into structures. You can say this is halo gas, really. And then if you look at this um, continuous line, which is this one, this is the proper warm hot intergalactic medium. And you see how this fraction is very, very low at high redshift and increases steeply and increases with redshift. This fraction varies with the simulations. Some other simulations find that this fraction is, is even higher than 50%. But this is basically the trend, that it increases with redshift. And this is because with decreasing redshift. And this is because structure formation in, um, basically evolves with redshift, and more and more gas is shock heated to high temperatures uh, with the passing of time. So you can do a similar analysis for the fraction of metals, which are, the few, which are produced in, in the universe. And you can see how they are, in what kind of um, phases you can find them, and how these fractions evolve with redshift. So this other figure down here, I hope you can read it, it's a little bit faint, represents the fraction of mass, and this is a logarithmic scale, now it's not a linear scale anymore, in different phases. So if you look at the first, and this plot I've taken from a new paper, an hour's paper from Ver Rob Veer's mind collaborator that came out at the beginning of February. And this is bas basically one of the same simulations that we show you in the following. So if you look at this first plot here, you see how the continuous line represents the fraction of metals which are locked in stars. And you can see that at high redshift, only a few percent of the metals are locked in stars, and at low redshift, basically um, 60 about 60% of them are locked in stars. On the other hand, you can also see how the fraction of metals in star-forming gas, and it's this dashed line here, is very, very high at, low, at high redshift and decreases very strongly with, at low redshift, and it becomes lower than 10%. On the other hand, you can also see that metals in the non-star forming gas, and this is the diffuse gas in the Lyman alpha forest or in the warm hot intergalactic medium, which is this line here, is not exactly constant, but roughly constant. It follows a little bit the behavior of the cosmic star formation history. And it's about somewhere between 20 and 40% at all times. So you can consider this metals in the non-star forming gas and you can divide them as a function of their temperature, of the temperature of the gas in which they in which they they, they are. So if you consider gas with temperatures lower than 10 to the 5 uh, Kelvin, which is the Lyman alpha forest gas for example, you find this kind of behavior. So this solid line is the Lyman alpha forest gas proper and you see how um, about less than 10 percent of the metals are traced in this gas at every redshift and you see how a larger fraction which is, again, up to 10, a little bit more than 10% at high redshift and decreases to maybe 5% at lower redshift, is actually in halo gas. So this is about 10% of the metals are in halo gas uh, at high redshift and a few percent at low redshift. You can also trace the fraction of the metals which are at higher temperatures. So in this case, it's 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 Kelvin, and these are the temperature of the warm hot intergalactic medium. And you see how only a fraction a few percent of the metals are in the warm hot intergalactic medium at, at high redshift, and this is redshift six, for example, and about 20%, between 20 and 30% of the metals are in the warm hot intergalactic medium at redshift zero. So this tells you that if you want to look for metals in an intergalactic medium, the best way to look for them in, at high redshift is to go to the Lyman alpha forest, Lyman alpha forest, lim damp Lyman alpha systems, and so on. This is halo gas, basically. If you want to look for them at low redshift, the best way, the best place to look for them is in hotter gas, so the warm hot intergalactic medium, which represents basically the bulk of the metals at low redshift, which are not locked in, locked in stars, of course. Of course, once you know where they are, you need some detection techniques. So depending on the temperature of the gas you, and the metals you want to look for, you can look in the in rest frame ultraviolet lines. 
So for example, Lyman alpha, Lyman alpha, oxygen 6, carbon 4, and so on. Or if you want to look for hotter metals, so with temperatures, for example, in excess of 10 to the 6, about 10 to the 6, these numbers are not uh, fixed in stones, of course, then you need to move to the soft X-ray band. And in particular, you can look for oxygen 7, oxygen 8 line, iron 17 lines, and so on. The X-ray band is a very rich uh, band for, for, for transitions. Then you can have different techniques to detect metals, of course. You can go to look for absorption lines, and this has been done, for example, at low redshift in the ultraviolet band. There have been several detections of Lyman alpha uh, absorption lines, uh, metal lines as well. These are only very, very few of the papers that have been written on the subject. At high redshift, and I mean redshift higher than 1.5 about, you can go to the optical band, and there have been also um, lots of detections with CAC, for example, and VLT, and also with zone of this, of this metal. And this, this basically have been the most successful searches for baryons in the intergalactic medium so far. Then you can also try to detect the X-ray forest at low redshift, and this has been done in a few cases. There are a couple of very controversial detections. The last one is from Boti, David Boti and collaborator. It came out about maybe a month and a half ago. It's this time. It, uh, this is a three sigma detection of oxygen seven uh, absorption from the sculpt from hot gas in the sculptor wall. This detection is probably less controversial than the Nicasson collaborator detection. First of all, because it's a three sigma and not a two two sigma detection. On the other hand, we know that there is an eye over density of galaxies there, so we expect to be uh, to find some hot gas there. So that means that it's a very good. Um, it's actually a very good uh, chance that we found a real detection. Okay, uh, you can try with absorption, but you can also try to detect um, emission lines from the warm hot intergalactic medium or the intergalactic medium. If you go to look for emission lines, it's very, very hard. The emissivity of the gas is usually very low. There have been pr predictions for the emission uh, from the intergalactic medium, and these are just some of the papers that have been published. But the only real detection so far is the detection of Lyman alpha blobs, which are supposed to be diffuse gas in the... Um, um, in the vicinity of proto-groups or proto-clusters at redshift of about three. And this has been detected, for example, by Weidinger and collaborators and other groups. And other groups. On the other hand, in the X-ray band, there have, been de there have been some predictions, again, but there haven't been uh, any real detections so far. And this is because mostly, mostly because the fluxes are very, very low and are far below the detection thresholds of current telescopes like Chandra and XMM. Okay, so if it's so hard to detect emission, then why do we want to do it in the first place if we have absorption uh, techniques which have been success successful so far to detect the intergalactic medium? Um, absorption is very nice and, as I said, has been really uh, successful and has given us a wealth of information, especially about the cooler fraction of, of the intergalactic medium. The problem of absorption is that it mostly gives, gives us one-dimensional information along the line of sight, so we need many, many lines of sight if we want to trace a three-dimensional distribution of the gas um, in space and as a function of redshift. And to do this, we need bright so background, bright sources. And it's not always easy to find these bright sources where we want them. And sometimes it's, um, it's really challenging to find enough to have a clear three-dimensional picture of the distribution of the gas. On the other hand, as I said, it's easier to detect. And so far, we have been able to detect gas which is also close to be under dense, so really gas at every density, almost every density in the universe. Emission, on the other hand, is very hard to detect, and it requires instruments which, more, which at the moment are really not, uh, not available, especially in the X-rays. But if we do detect it, then we have fully three-dimensional information about the spatial distribution of this gas and about, the and about its evolution with, with redshift. And also, we can get very, very clear information about the velocity field of the gas, the metallicity, and so on, especially by detecting line ratios. So it would be a huge step forward in our understanding of the distribution and physical state of the intergalactic medium. So what I'm doing here, in particular, is to use numerical simulation to try to make predictions about what, can be observed, what kind of lines can be observed, what would be the spatial distribution of the emission we could expect um, in, the, um, in the universe. So to do this, I've been using a new set of numerical simulation, the AUS simulation, 
which have been running Leiden. Yob Shea has been the PA of the PI of the project. There are many, many, many people involved in the project at the moment. These are just some of the people that have contributed to um, the development of the new code and to the running of the simulation. In particular, Claudia Della Vecchia has run most of the simulation. Rob Biersma has contributed most of the new physical modules. Marcel Haas is studying, in particular, the evolution of galaxies in the simulation. Volker Springel has contributed an improvement um, of the gadget code, which was the ba gadget 2 code, which is uh, the, basic, the basis of the code that we developed for the new simulations. Luca Tornatore has provided the chemical evolution model, Tom Torrance, um, other techniques to, to study the lemon of the forest, and so on. Okay, some of you may have heard about the owl simulation, some of you may have not, so I'm going to spend maybe five minutes just to describe them um, in very, very broad terms. So what is owls? Owls is a set of cosmological hydrodynamical simulations. Um, it has been run using boxes of about 25 megaparsecs and 100 megaparsecs, co-moving, uh, with periodic boundary conditions. The evolution of the gas in the simulation and dark matter is followed from redshift of about 100 down to redshift 2, or zero depending on the box. The simulations are not particularly large. We only use about two, two times 512 cube particles. So these are not comparable to the Millennium simulation or the Via Lactea or anything. They are not you know, as huge boxes with as many particles. We use a WMAP3 cosmology. And the simulations have been run on the Lofar supercomputer. Um, but the main point of ours is actually the fact that there is not only one simulation or two simulations, but there are about 70 different runs at the moment which use different physical prescriptions, different simulation boxes, different numerical resolution, different implementation of diff different um, physical, um, physical Im different implementation of different physical mechanisms like galactic winds and star formation and so on. So what we can do with ours ultimately is not to have one model which reproduces the universe exactly as it should be, but is to have different models in which we change one piece of physics at a time so we can compare results from different simulations and see what is the effect of changing that particular piece of physics, like feedback, for example, on the global results of the simulation, on the global results or on some specific details, on, on some specific predictions, like, for example, the cosmic star formation history. And this is something that hasn't been done so, so far in such a large scale as we have done with ours. So, of course, to start, we have one physical model, which is our default model. As I said, it doesn't have to be the realistic model. It's just the one we start from, um, and we change the physical prescriptions one at a time. So, in this new default model, there are several new prescriptions, which improve um, the, the physics that was already implemented in Gadget 2. So, in particular, we have a new star formation module. This has all been, have all been described in this paper already. There is a new wind model. This, in particular, improves the modeling gadget too because it implements the winds as a local to the star formation event. And also the winds are hydrodynamically coupled to the rest of the gas um, at all times. There is a new chemodynamics module. And this is described in, Rob, in the paper from Rob Viersma from 2009. This is important because we now follow explicitly the chemical evolution and by different 11 different elements which are listed here. And they are followed explicitly at all times. Also, we have a new initial stellar mass function, mass function which is the Chabré MF. And we have also Supernova 1A and HB feedback implemented, which was not implemented in Gadget 2 so far. The main module which will influence, um, in particular, the results that we show in the following is a new cooling module. So cooling in Gadget 2 and in other numerical simulations as well was implemented assuming that only helium, e helium and hydrogen contribute to the cooling rate. What we do in ours is instead to calculate cooling rates, dependent, um, calculate metal dependent cooling rates using all the 11 elements present in the simulation. I will describe, and also we include a photoionization mechanism by unevolving UV background or the form of the heart and Madal. I'm going to spend some more words to describe this in the, in the next slide. But before doing that, I just want to show you a couple of, um, a couple of lines about the kind of physical variations we can have in the simulations. So what we can change and what we have changed in the, in the, different, run, in the different runs is the cosmology. So we have tried, we have tried a WMAP1, WMAP3 is a default, and a WMAP5 cosmology to see how this influences the result. You can change the reionization prescription, and you can also add helium, helium reionization. 
you can, we change the metal cooling, um, the gas cooling uh, scheme in the simulation. We change the star formation prescription. So we tried, for example, top heavy IMF, isothermal adiabatic, and adiabatic equation of state, and so on. This, in particular, is not going to modify significantly my results. So I'm not going to show you any simulations with different prescriptions for star formation. We also changed the feedback implementation. So of course, we have a no feedback run um, to like as a control run. We, ha we can change the feedback intensity, so in increasing or decreasing the mass loading of the wind, the initial velocity of the wind, and so on. We can change the feedback implementation in general. So for example, the main, um, the main our feedback scheme is, a, is a basically a pressure-driven implementation of winds, but we can also try a momentum-driven, a low penimer and away. We can try a different implementation of pressure-driven winds, like, uh, which is basically exactly the Springer and Ernquist model. We can switch off and on AGN feedback, or we can also switch on and off supernova 1A enrichment, a AGB mass transfer. And in chemodynamics, we can, um, of course, change the parameters of the chemo chemodynamics or change the initial cellar mass function, and so on. And by comparing results from this simulation, we can try to understand which, is the, um, which one is the physics that best reproduces what we see in the real universe, of course. So as I said, I want to spend a couple of words more on the gas cooling prescriptions. Um, what is shown here are a couple of plots from the paper from Rob Wiersma, uh, Job Shen and uh, Britta Smith from 2008, which is already published. This is basically the new cooling scheme implemented in, in gadgetry. So if you, can, if you look at this red line, this is the line that basically gives you the cooling rate, in this case, um, considering only collisional ionization equilibrium for hydrogen and helium. Okay, it's this red line here. If you consider metal line cooling, and this for solar abundances in particular, then you see that each element, and these are the 11 ones in our simulation, contributes a different, um, different, basically corresponds to each of these lines. So if you sum them all up, you find the black line. And if you compare the black line with the red line, you see how the primordial cooling rate, which is the one uh, represented by the red line, is very, very different from the metal line dependent cooling rate, which can be orders of magnitude, up to two orders of magnitude different in some, in some uh, temperature regimes. So this red line is the one implemented, for example, in Gadget 2. If you consider also an evolving UV background, you can also calculate a contribution to the cooling rate from photoionization equilibrium lines. And this contribution is going to be density dependent. It's not that in density independent like the one given only by collision ionization equilibrium. So the photoionization equilibrium cooling rates are in, which can be added to, the, to obtain the total cooling rate are represented here. Again, you can see the primordial abundances, which is a red line, and you can see how when you add metal line cooling, you have this higher black line, which is about an order of magnitude different in some cases from the primordial cooling rates. This is in particularly important, important in the low density and low temperature regime, where the photoionization, um, where the UV background actually makes a substantial contribution and determines the temperature of the gas, especially. All right. So this is important because once you know the cooling rate of the gas, you can also calculate the emissivity of the gas. And you can, do, um, you can calculate the emissivity of the gas line by line if you're interested in, in specific lines. This is what I've done here. So both the, cooli both the cooling rate and the emissivity have been calculated with uh, cloudy. So we have created two-dimensional tables as a function of density and temperature. And then to calculate the emission or the, or the cooling in the simulation, we have interpolated this, um, this density and temperature um, tables. So what, I show you, what I'm showing you in this, in this figure is the emissivity of a set of different lines. So in this first column, you find ultraviolet emission lines. And in these last two columns, you see soft X-ray emission lines. The upper panels are for dense gases. So this is a mm, hydrogen number density of one atom per cubic centimeter. This is 10 to the minus 3 per cubic centimeter. And this is 10 to the minus 6 cubic centimeter. And I plot this different, these three different um, density regime because I want to show you the effect of photoionization um, on, the, on the emissivity of the lines. So as you can see at very high density, the emissivity uh, doesn't, is basically only the emissivity of collisionally ionized gas. If you go to, when you go to lower densities, and you can already see here, in particular at low density, and you can see it very well here at very low 
at very, very low density and in particular low temperature, here you see how the contribution from photoionization kicks in. So you don't have this very sharp cutoff at low temperature, but you have this kind of more shallow profiles and you have for like this really kind of flat profile in the X-rays. You can also compare the emissivity of different lines and you, it should jump to your eyes almost immediately the fact that the emissivity in ultraviolet is kind of much higher than the emissivity in the soft X-rays. So, and that this tells you already that the emission in UV is going to be much more intense than the emission, the emission in X-rays. Um, finally, I just want you to notice that the, um, yes, of course, these are also calculating, um, including the effect of the, ionis the UV ionizing background. All right, once you have the emissivity, you can then um, use the emissivity together with the information you have about the density, the temperature, and the metallicity of the particles in the simulation, and you can try to calculate the emission in your simulation and try to map it as much as you would try to map the emission from an intergalactic medium in the sky. So what I'm going to show you in the following is, first of all, some soft X-ray emission lines at redshift of about zero. Um, I, I will then show you the same emission in the ultraviolet at low redshift. And finally, in the last part of my talk, I will try to show you the emission at high redshift. So the evolu in particular between redshift two and redshift um, five in rest frame ultraviolet emission line, which is basically similar to what I will show you at low redshift, but at high redshift, the, emission the UV emission lines will be redshifted in the optical band. So um, since optical telescopes are much more sensible than UV telescopes, we can basically um, have a better chance to detect them. Okay, let's start from X-rays at redshift. All the results I'm going to show you are going to be at redshift point 25. I'm going to show you a set of about 12 different emission lines in the soft X-rays. I've chosen these 12 as the, mo as the strongest emission lines in our sample um, and the most likely to detect. Um, of course, you can do the same kind of study for any other emission line you want to, you want to detect. I'm going to show you maps which are mostly realized assuming an angular resolution of 15 arc seconds. This is because there have been some, kind, some telescopes um, that have been proposed that will uh, have a similar angular resolution. So this will be directly comparable to what they could, these telescopes could see. I'm going to use the 100 megaparsec boxes for this kind of studies at low redshift, and I'm going to cut slices of about 20 megaparsecs through the simulation. So the maps you see are going, uh, are going to assume a thickness of the slice of about 20 megaparsec co-moving. So what I show you here in this, first, in this first image that should give you an impression of what, what I'm going to show you in the following is the whole box plotted with, of course, with a thickness of 20 megaparsec, the whole box of 100 megaparsec here, and I'm going to show you zoom-ins on smaller regions. So here you see a zoom-in on a region of 10 megaparsec, and here you see on a zoom-in on a region of about one megaparsec, co-moving, of course. This is the oxygen-8 line, which is the strongest line we have identified in the, um, in the sample of lines we have considered so far. All right, that was oxygen-8. In the following, I'm going to show you zoom in some regions of about four, 13 megaparsec on the side. And in this map in particular, I'm going to show you the emission of 12, the 12 different emission lines we have in our sample in the soft X-ray UV band. So I don't know if you can read them, but the one over there is carbon-5, this is carbon-6, nitrogen-7, oxygen-7, this is the resonance line, and this is and this is the forbidden, no, sorry, this is the forbidden, this is the resonance line, this is oxygen-8, this is neon-9, neon-10, magnesium-12, silicon-13, sulfur-15, and iron-17 lines. So what you can notice immediately, as I said, is the fact that oxygen-8 gives us the strongest emission. The strongest emission, not only at the center of the group, this is one of the largest groups in our simulation, but also in filaments, like here, and also in more diffuse structures, like here, for example. And you can see, for example, the fact that it's stronger by comparing to oxygen-7 or carbon-6 and so on. Other strong lines are carbon-6 over there, oxygen-7, um, oxygen of course, is a very strong uh, triplet of lines. These I'm going to show you. I'm showing you only two of them. Carbon-5 is relatively strong. Ni nitrogen-7 is kind of strong, not too much. Neon 10 it is very strong, and neon 9 also is relatively important. What you can also notice is the different spatial distribution of the emission 
So for example, if you look at oxygen or carbon lines, you see that it's more homogeneous, this homogeneously distributed in space than, for example, neon 10 or these other lines like magnesium, sulfur, and silicon. And this is because these lines are emitted by higher temperature gas, which is more condensed and can be found in halos with higher temperatures. So for example, in the group here, in the group here, but it's not diffused um, in filaments and so on, where the gas simply cannot reach that, those high temperatures. So that tells you that if you go to look for this kind of lines, you will only trace high density regions. If you look for instead for nine, um, neon nine or oxygen lines or carbon lines, then you can trace in principle lower density regions than, uh, than these other different lines. I also want to spend a couple of words about iron 17. Iron 17 is a relatively um, strong and in intense line. The problem with Iron, iron 17 lines is the fact that iron is produced by supernova type 1A um, ex supernova explosions. So it's not diffused as much as alpha elements in the in, into the intergalactic medium. And this is because galactic, galactic winds are very efficient to distribute matters in the intergalactic medium. But iron 17, again, being produced by supernova type 1A, is produced later when the winds are not as efficient as they were at the end when most of the star formation took place. So it's basically not distributed into intergalactic medium as efficiently as all other elements. And this means that you will find it mostly in very high density regions and in the halos of galaxies. So for example, this is uh, where you find a filament, but you see that it's not very distributed. It's just staying around galaxies. It's somewhat distributed, but not, definitely not as much as oxygen or neon or carbon lines. So this means that you can only trace really high density regions with iron lines, even iron 17. All right, so this is again the temperature density plane, but this time the distribution is not weighted by mass or metal mass, it's actually weighted by emission. So if you look for the bulk, it's for the, for the, the bulk here, of what this means that this, this, these blobs here are the bulk of the emission, so where most of the emission is coming from in different lines. Um, so if you look so at is oxygen... Is it the volumetric emission or is it the... Sorry? Band, is it the volumetric emission or is it band weighted emission that you use for weighting? I use the total emission of a particle for weighting. So that's a volumetric emission? Yes. <laughs> this does this then change if you consider, say, a given finite band of some X-ray telescope? No, no, this is done by particles, so the, this is no, no compar not comparable directly with observations. This is not taken from the maps. This I'm just taking the emission from single particles in the simulations. So that It's weighted by the, the emission by that particle. Okay. So instead of weighting by the mass of the particle or the matter mass of the particle, I just calculate the emission by that particle in the simulation and weigh the distribution by the emission in the particles. Okay. All right, so again, you can see here oxygen-8. Oxygen-8 traces the one hot intergalactic medium relatively well. It also traces higher temperature gas. And you can divide this kind of distribution by the lines that better trace the one hot intergalactic medium, the lines, the lines that trace hotter gas, um, the lines that trace cooler gas for the ultraviolet line, lines, as I'm going to show you in the following. So the lines that you can see that trace better, best the, the warm hot intergalactic medium are the carbon lines, as I showed you before, the nitrogen lines, which you can see here, the oxygen lines, basically all of them, the neon line, line the iron 17 line, although this is hot gas, which is still some kind, some kind of bound to structures, it's actually in the outskirts of, of groups, um, of, of clusters and in groups. And then you see other lines like the sulfur, the silicon, the magnesium, the neon 10, and this trace relatively higher, higher temperature gas. So they still trace partly the warm hot intergalactic medium, but it's going to be difficult to distinguish between proper warm hot intergalactic medium and halo gas, um, dense halo gas. So this other figure down here is just to show you how um, gas with different temperatures produces different levels of emission. So this is X ray, of course, this is oxygen 8. Again, if you take gas with temperatures lower than 10 to the 6 Kelvin, then you have very, very low emission because it, this is just too low. The, the emissivity in this, in this temperature regime is very low, so th there is definitely not, not much emission. If you look at gas between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 6 Kelvin, you see how this gas is distributed um, in, the outskirts, in the outskirts of this group, in the filament here. You can see this very thick filament. You see another group here. 
And then you can have the hotter gas, this is hotter than 10 to the 7, and you see how this is basically just the halo gas, and a little bit in this filament, but just because it's a very big filament, but it's mostly just the halo gas. All right, this was for X-rays. You can do the same game for ultraviolet lines at redshift of about 0.25. So what I've done here is a map of oxygen-6 emission, for example. Again, you see the zoom in between the 100 megaparsec, 10 megaparsec, and 1 megaparsec box. Um, something you can notice immediately, a difference from the X-ray emission, is the fact that X-ray emission, uh, if you remember the oxygen-8 plot, was some kind, somewhat diffuse in the box. If you compare it with oxygen-6 emission, oxygen-6 emission is definitely not as diffuse as the oxygen-8 emission was. But you see all these little lumps, um, all these little, come somehow tracing the filaments through the lumps themselves, and so on. And you can see it even better here, where mo in, the, in the center of these groups, there is basically no, almost virtually no strong emission at all. This is actually a background source. And most of the emission is actually concentrated in the, in, uh, in, in the outskirts of galaxies, in, in galaxies themselves. So you can consider different emission lines. Here I just considered the four strongest ones, in particular carbon-4, nitrogen-5, oxygen-6 again, and uh, neon-8. And you can make maps of the emission. So you can compare directly carbon-4 and oxygen-6, which are the, strong, the two strongest lines. And you can see again uh, quite a substantial difference. You see that oxygen-6 is already less diffuse than X-ray emission was, but carbon-4 is even less diffuse than oxygen-6. And this is because carbon-4 traces cooler gas than oxygen-6 does, and it's mostly concentrated really in, the, in, the, in, in galaxies in, in their immediate vicinities, in particular in the halos. Um, similar thing for nitrogen-5, while neon-8 traces relatively hotter gas and is somewhat more diffuse than, um, than carbon-4, and, uh, and similarly diffuse, um, spatially diffuse as oxygen-6 is. Again, here you see the temperature density plane. This basically tells you what I told you already, the fact that if you look at nitrogen-5, and in particular carbon-4 gas, this is gas which is in the, in the halos of galaxies, so most of the emission will come from relatively high density regions. Oxygen-6 traces somewhat the cooler fraction of the warm hot intergalactic medium and some of the gas that is bound to galaxies as well, as you can see here. While neon-8 will trace definitely hotter gas with temperatures which are totally within the regime uh, of the warm hot intergalactic medium but far higher than carbon-4 and somewhat higher than oxygen-6. And again, if you divide the emission uh, as a function of the temperature of the gas that emits and you see how at very high temperature you don't see anything, um, at temperatures between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 7 Kelvin in oxygen, this is oxygen 6 lines, you will see some of the emission in particular from filaments and other filaments here in groups and most of the emission will, 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 will be actually produced by very cool gas with temperatures of less than 10 to the 6 Kelvin. So you can put um, everything together at low redshift and you can try to see how the flux that you can measure from the intergalactic medium is correlated with the density, the temperature, and the metallicity of the gas that produces it. So if you look at the middle panel here, you see how the medium temperature of the gas that produces a given flux is relatively constant for fluxes higher than a minimum. So these are the higher fluxes. These fluxes tend to be um, very low, uh, in very low density gas and very low metallicity gas. So if you look here, you will see that this is carbon-4, this is oxygen-6, um, these are oxygen-7 and carbon-6, this is oxygen-8 and this is neon, no, sorry, yes, this is oxygen-8 and this is neon-10. You can see that the, the medium temperature that produces the flux is actually corresponding to the temperature where the emissivity peaks has a, has a maximum, okay? You remember the emissivity shapes were of this kind, and the, temp the temperature where the emissivity peaks actually corresponds to this, um, this kind of, these temperatures here. So if you measure an emission line, um, most of the times you will measure um, gas with a temperature which corresponds or is very close to the, uh, the peak of the emissivity of that, the temperature where the emissivity peaks. On the other hand, in this panel, we show the mean, um, the median density of the gas that produces a given flux. And this, of course, the median density increases 
with the flux. And this is something you can expect because, of course, the emission from uh, gas is proportional to density squared. So you kind of expect this correlation. Same, the same thing for the metallicity. You see that the medium uh, metallicity of, of particles that produce a given flux is actually increasing with the flux. And this is, of course, something that, again, you can expect because you risk, uh, what we do is to rescale the emission with the metallicity of the gases. So you expect that the medium metallicity that produces a given flux increases in this case. On the other hand, this also tells you that, of course, you can relatively realistically identify the temperature of the gas that produces that, that kind of line, but you can also get some really good information about the time density and the metallicity of the gas. Unfortunately, there will be a degeneracy if you measure only one emission line between density, density, and, temper density and metallicity of that, of that gas. But if you can measure different emission lines, for example, oxygen 7 and oxygen 8 at the same time, or maybe oxygen 8, oxygen 7, and oxygen 6, then you could have a really good handle on the density and the metallicity, and you could try to solve the degeneracy and have more detailed information about the, the, the gas itself. All right. So as I said, ours is very good because we have different runs and we can compare different simulations and understand what kind of differences we can, um, we can get from different physical models. So I've done this in particular for oxygen 8, and I'm going to show you the results for, oxygens, um, for oxygen 6 in a moment. The results will be uh, about the, the, the physical effects will be basically similar, so I'm not going to spend much time on oxygen 6, but I'm going to show you some details about oxygen 8, what you can see in oxygen 8 emission, which is shown here. So in this six panels, you, def you see results for the oxygen 8 emission in six different simulations. The simulations always use the same initial conditions, the same particle resolution, the same box dimension, and everything. The only thing that is changed is one physical prescription at a time. So in this panel here, you see the default simulation. That's the same one I've been showing you so far. In this other plot, you see a simulation in which there is no supernova feedback. So this is only um, the simulation with star formation and everything, but no galactic winds implemented. Yeah? No. OK. So you can see immediately the difference between the two. Uh, the emission, while here it's relatively diffuse, here the emission is concentrated in blobs, in filaments, and in high-density regions. And this is because when you don't have any feedback, the metals are not spreading to the intergalactic medium. So in the low-density intergalactic medium, you don't have metals, you don't produce emission, basically. All right? In this other simulation here, the Z cool zero, the physical prescriptions are the same except for the cooling prescription. So while this simulation uses metal line dependent cooling rates. In this simulation, we are using primordial abundance cooling rates. So the difference in this case is that the gas cools much more slowly because the cooling rate, of course, is lower than in the, me than in the um, metal line dependent cooling case. So the gas is hotter in general, especially in the centers of halos where you uh, have the most metal enriched gas. So if you compare the center of this group here with the center of this group here, you basically find that the flux that you can measure here is about two orders of magnitude higher than what you would measure in this case where you consider metal line cooling. The difference is not very high in the, very low, in the diffuse intergalactic medium, and this is because the metallicity um, outside large groups is much lower, so the difference in the cooling rate is not that prominent. Yeah? So that's in line that we have actually a worse cooling flow problem with your metal dependent simulation. I wouldn't say anything about you cooling problem, about, about the cooling the flow. Of, uh, stars or mm -hmm. stars of, uh, so um, that's something I, I don't have to show you. Some, some other people are working on it. And I, I've seen the results, but they're not published yet. So it definitely gives a big, it, it gives a big change. I mean, I it gives a big change in the self-formation history of the simulation, yes. It definitely you would, does. You would overproduce one of stars a lot, I guess, if you include the metal. I mean, if I just look at this plus, it just tells me it's right. Yes, that's why you need AGN feedback, right? Correct. Which is implemented in this other simulation. And if you compare this one with this one, you find that with the addition of AGN feedback, the fluxes you measure here, especially in the central groups, are about orders of magnitude smaller with AGN feedback. Okay, so that somewhat solves your. Kind of for the 
So this agent feedback is the agent feedback. It's a combination of the model of Tiziana Di Matteo and a combination with the model of Deborah Sijaki. So it includes um, AGN, proper agent feedback plus radio feedback. Okay. On the other hand, I wouldn't say too much about cooling flows using the 100 megapartite boxes simulations because this is not a large cluster. This is only a group with a mass of about few times 10 to the 14 solar masses. So um, it's not representative of a large cluster. Um, so these results you know, are fine, but I wouldn't consider this a cooling flow cluster or non-cooling flow cluster in the simulation. You would need some cluster simulations themselves to say something more, I think. All right, so, well, we've said it already. This is an um, AGN feedback simulation, um, and the flux, flux here is much lower than in, than in, the, in the default model, especially in the high-density regions. Again, AGN feedback doesn't give you a substantial dif difference when you go to consider the really diffuse intergalactic medium or the intergalactic medium in filaments, for example. So in these last two panels, which you can compare again to the default model, we have changed the supernova feedback scheme. In particular, in... This model here, the WMON model, we have uh, implemented galactic winds as Romil Dave and Ben Oppenheimer have done. The, and galactic winds are represented as momentum driven outflows. So outflows of cold gas, basically. In this other model, WDENS, it's another way of implementing momentum driven wind, but in this case, the, wind, the, the energy we impart on the wind is dependent on the, on the properties of the halo, and in particular on the density distribution of the halos. So the results from the WDENS and the default model are very similar. They change by a few percent, but it's not a significant difference. The largest difference you actually find with the, with the momentum-driven wind model. The difference should jump immediately to your eyes. So if you just compare the emission, you see that the, the profile of the emission is much more shallow in the momentum-driven, while in the, um, in the default model, you see the profile of the emission, the radio profile of the emission in the groups is much more, is going down much more quickly. This is because when you have momentum-driven winds, the gas which is ejected by galactic winds is, is hot and is ejected very efficiently. It's transported to larger distances. The metals especially are transported to larger di distances. They are, they are cooler, so the emission is not as high because the temperature of the gas um, is also cooler. But the emission is, is going farther away from the halo because there are more metals because of the more efficient transport and so on. So this difference you can also see in the uh, ultraviolet emission lines. This is again oxygen-6. The simulations are the same. You can see that, again, if you don't have any winds, the metals are concentrated into galaxies, so you have this very, very dot-like distribution of the emission. In the momentum-driven wind, you see that it's somewhat more spatially distributed, and again, it's a little bit more, um, it's a little bit lower levels than it is in, in the standard case. Agent feedback, again, um, it's mostly important in the very center of centers of Hellas. Basically, the results are, are um, the, 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 um, the implications of the physical variations are the same for the ultraviolet lines and the soft X-ray lines. All right, so this was for low redshift emission, which you can detect in ultraviolet, which you could detect in ultraviolet or uh, soft X-rays. Unfortunately, the telescopes for those particular wavebands are not ideal for detected diffuse emission. There have been some telescopes which have been proposed for the future, but they are somewhat far away um, in, in time, on scales of five to 10 years, if not longer. On the other hand, what we can do is to try to detect rest frame ultraviolet emission lines at high redshift, where, as I said, they are redshifted into the optical wavelength. And that makes it much easier because we do have telescopes at the moment which are very efficient to detect optical emission, in particular Keck, but also other instruments. So what I'm going to show you now uh, for the last minute of my talk is some predictions we have done at redshift between 2 and 5 and how these fluxes um, evolve with redshift. So I'm going to use, um, as I said, different simulations. I'm going to use, in this case, boxes of 25 megaparsecs with a uh, mass resolution, resolution which is about eight times higher than in the, um, in the 100 megaparsec box. And the maps I'm going to make, I'm going to show you in the, sh in the following, are, use, are made using an angular resolution of two arc seconds, which is more comparable which were, with what um, optical telescopes can do. As I said, Keck um, is one of the telescopes that would be able to detect this kind of emission. 
um, demos could be one of the instruments that could be used, for example. There are also different instruments which could be used. Um, Muse and VLT has also, proposed, has also been proposed for this, this end. But the instrument I want to focus in particular in my talk is a cosmic web imager, which is going to be mounted on Palomar um, in the next month, and it's going to be online by the end of the year, and most likely is going to give us some, hopefully, good results by the end of the year itself. So this is actually the most likely case that we have so far to detect um, line emission from the, one, from the intergalactic medium um, of all the cases I've discussed today. So as I said, we can try to, um, to detect lines at redshift higher than 1.5 or 2. Um, the lines are the ultraviolet emission lines, and what we need in particular to do this kind of web is instruments like the CWI, and CWI is an integral field spectrograph with a, very lar with a large field of view of a few arc minutes and very high spatial and um, spectrum resolution. All right, so these are some of the maps of the emission. Again, you can see basically the same lines I've shown you before. This is carbon-4, nitrogen-5, oxygen-6, neon-8, and silicon-4 in this case. The evolution here is shown from redshift 2, 3, 4, and 5 going down. And you can see basically similar uh, spatial distributions I've shown you before. Of course, this is redshift 2 to 5, so the gas at that, that, those kind of redshift is cooler than it is at redshift 0. And here you can see that most of the emission comes from the center of the dense region, so center of groups, proto-groups, proto-clusters, and so on. Because in those groups, in this case, the temperature is not high enough to produce X-ray emission. The temperature is not 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8. It's probably 10 to the 6 or so, which is good to detect um, ultraviolet emission lines. So if you compare carbon-4 and oxygen-6, you see again the different spatial distributions. So carbon-4 is more lumpy than oxygen-8, oxy, um, oxygen-6, sorry, oxygen-8. Oh, no. Oxygen-6 emission is more diffused. Um, neon-8 emission is again more diffused. And silicon emission traces um, carbon-4 emission relatively well. So there are other, a series of other ultraviolet emission lines, no, sorry, which are shown in this map. These are lower ionization states than the emission lines I've shown in the following. This is in particular carbon-3, nitrogen-4, oxygen-4, oxygen-5, and silicon-3. Some of these will be visible between redshift 2 and 5 in the optical. Some of these, like oxygen-4 and oxygen-5, will remain outside this regime until high redshift. But I think it's very interesting because if you compare the intensity of silicon-3 and silicon-4, or carbon-3 and carbon-4, and you can do this by just comparing those panels directly. So what you can see is, the, is that the emission from carbon-3, for example, is much higher than the emission from carbon-4. It's about an order of magnitude higher than from carbon-4, which makes it very interesting because it, you may have a good chance to detect it. The problem of carbon-3 is that it's at a wavelength of 900 and about 70 angstrom, so that means that it's, it's, it's blended with Lyman alpha forest, so it suffers from all the problems of Lyman alpha um, emission, scattering, and so on, and of course, uh, blending. So that will be difficult to identify. On the other hand, if you identify carbon-4, then you know where carbon-3 is, you can go and look for it, and since it's such a strong line, you may have a very good chance to detect it. Maybe you, if, it, if it's blended, of course, it will be difficult to, to disentangle from Lyman alpha and other lines, but you still know that it's there, and you can put some constraints on its strength. And if you have car and if it's not blended, then you can actually see it, then it would be great, because if you have carbon-3 and carbon-4, then you can put more stringent constraints about the temperature, not only the temperature, but also the density and the metallicity of that gas you're proving. Same, of course, for oxygen-4, oxygen-5, and oxygen-6. Same for silicon-3 and si silicon-4, of course. So what I'm showing you here is the probability distribution function of the flux, this for the lower ionization states and this for the higher ionization states. Um, another problem of the lower ionization states is the fact that there are single lines, while the higher ionization states like carbon for a doublet line. So while a doublet is relatively easy to identify because you know the structure of the doublet, so it, you expect the properties that they should have, single lines are very difficult to identify um, uniquely. You, re you really need to know about the, the higher ionization state and then go to look for them. So anyway, if you compare the probability distribution fluxes, for example, for carbon-4, which is this pink line here, and for carbon-3, which is the other pink line here, you see how the fluxes here are about, are about an order of magnitude higher than the fluxes here. Same for the oxygen lines and same, same for the silicon lines. 
All right, then you can ask again yourself, where does the emission come from, from the density temperature plane? And this tells you what kind of gas is produced in the emission. And you see how the silicon lines and the carbon lines trace this dense, relatively cool gas. And this is the gas, as I said, in the halos of galaxies, and gas that is basically uh, falling onto the intergalactic medium, uh, or the, on the interstellar medium of galaxies, uh, and so on. But if you look at oxygen lines, oxygen 4 is here, oxygen 5 and oxygen 6, these are better traces of the warm hot intergalactic medium, although, as you can see, they also trace somewhat gas. Gas is somewhat bound to the halos of galaxies. And again, neonate, as I said before, is a hotter line, so it traces much more diffuse and definitely hotter gas than the other lines. All right, this is just a cart um, final <coughs> cartoon I want to show you. Uh, so the sensitivity of the CWI, the instrument on Palomar, is going to be of about 100 photons per second per square centimeter per star radian. And it, has, it, it will have an angular resolution of about two arc seconds, as I said. So if you consider the color scale down here, which is the color scale I used for these maps, and these are carbon-3, carbon-4, oxygen-6, and neon-8, that kind of flux limit of 100 photons in line unit is going to be these two here. So it's going to be here. So basically, CWI, this tells you that CWI will be able to see everything that is going to be in this color regime here, which is dark orange to red to white. So if you look for this red and white on the maps, you can see how it's all these regions here, all those regions there, the oxygen emission here, and the carbon-4 emission here. So it's actually a substantial emission from relatively high density regions, but it's definitely a diffuse emission with, which is within the detection limit of, of the instrument. So within the end of the year, by the end of the year, if CWI works um, as it should, and if the emission levels are comparable to the ones predicted by our simulations, we should be able to detect some of the emission. And this will be, besides the lemon alpha blobs, the first if you diffuse emission we, have, we will have detected from the diffuse intergalactic medium. Sorry? Oh, the scale of the box is down here. This is about, uh, this is one megaparsec moving. Okay. Yeah, so all these boxes are one megaparsec. So, white red region the galaxy, Yeah, a little bit larger than the galaxy. Yeah, but basically, yeah. Diffuse halos of galaxies. This is like a group. The galaxies, you know, you know, they are part of these sources. Yeah, you should see the galaxy definitely. This is more like a group. So what you see here is the emission from the intragroup medium, proto group. I wouldn't say proto cluster, but group. Um, so you would expect to see more than one galaxy in this field, definitely. Well, you, you're not going to see a whole wall of galaxies, but you're going to see more than one galaxy there, definitely. Two arc seconds. The spectral resolution. Oh, um, I don't remember. High enough to identify the lines, though. But I don't remember exactly. We can check. We can check the proposal. So if you degrade the resolution of the spectrograph, it means that your pixels will be 10 times smaller. So if you have a pixel which is 10 times smaller and it's going to take in this part, the flux will be diffused. So the flux in that pixel would be much lower. And also, yes, but the, pixel in the, the flux in that pixel will be lower. And also if you put the pixels all together, you're not going to see a structure like this. You're just going to see probably something much more uniform. So if you see something uniform in diffused in like nine pixel, you're not going to get any spatial distribution, spatial information about the distribution of that gas, and that's not what you want to do, because you want the spatial distribution. Yes. As I said, the flux in the pixel is going to be much much lower, so it may become much lower than this number, right? A smaller angular resolution means higher fluxes. Yeah. 
Okay, I just want to give you a brief summary about the lines we were considering. So these are the lines, these are the wavelengths of the lines. Of course, depending on the wavelength of the line, these lines will enter the optical um, wavelength at different redshift. Assuming a minimum wavelength of 3,500 angstrom for our spectrograph, this is the redshift where we can start seeing the lines. So it's going to be different for each of them. Some of them will enter below redshift 2, like the carbon 4 and nitrogen 5. Some of them will enter only at high redshift. So for example, the oxygen 4 and oxygen 5 will be visible only far beyond redshift 4, which makes them relatively useless to detect in optical. On this last column, I show you the maximum redshift where the flux we predict in the simulation basically um, is, is higher than the flux limit of CWI. And you can see how many of these lines will be visible up to redshift 3, in particular carbon 4, oxygen 6, oxygen 6, where is it? Here, and the silicon lines will be visible up to redshift 3. If we could detect carbon 3 alone, carbon 3 would be actually detectable up to redshift 4, but of course, it's a single line, so it will be difficult to identify it as such if we don't have carbon 4 emission. Nitrogen 5 up to redshift 2. A number of these lines won't be visible, for example, neon 8, which is very, very, um, it's always suggested as a very interesting line. It is, because it's very, um, it's a fraction of hotter uh, hotter, warm hot intergalactic medium. It's actually entering the optical um, region very late. And the fluxes we predict are very, very low. So it doesn't look to be, it, it doesn't seem very likely we are going to be able to detect in, in, absor in emission at least. Absorption lines may be giving us better results. And nitrogen lines also are going to be visible only up to redshift 2. They're much weaker than oxygen and carbon lines. Finally, just a quick, very quick summary to summarize what I said so far. Ultraviolet lines and some of the soft X-ray lines will be very good to trace relatively low density regions of the, inter, uh, of the warm hot intergalactic medium in particular. Other lines, in particular the neon lines, the magnesium, silicon, sulfur, and iron lines will be only very good, to, we will be only good to trace relatively high density regions, but they won't be able to trace filaments or particularly low density regions. Of course, oxygen-8 can be able to trace basically any density, any density in the warm hot intergalactic medium and definitely the best tracers in the soft X-rays, in the soft X-ray band. Uh, I forgot to remove it from here, it shouldn't be here. Um, also, the detection of the warm hot intergalactic medium in emission is going to be very challenging in low density regions, in particular in densities um, with low densities such as low density like, like filaments or even lower density regions. But it's going to be very likely to be uh, feasible in groups and in the outskirts of clusters. So in regions intermediate be those, between those that are measured today, for example, by Chandra and XMM and those that we would like to detect in filaments and so on by future telescopes. And for future telescopes here, I mean even the International X-ray Observatory or maybe even EDGE and Xenia, if they will ever manage to fly. And finally, the most likely, um, the best chance we have to detect diffuse emission is actually at high redshift in the optical waveband and in rest frame vision lines. And we, if we are lucky, by the end of the year, we may have our first detections of this diffuse gas, and that would be really our first step forward behind, behind, beyond Lyman alpha blobs. And that's all. Oh, they're low in comparison yeah, to so the background. Like, yes. Yeah, no, they're definitely much lower than the, than the background that is predicted. Um, so I'm not an expert about observations, but the technique that they are thinking to use with the CWI is not in shuffle, and they think that that's enough to basically subtract the background and make the emission line shine. Mm -hmm. Go off the